So I start off with a quick reminder of how our inputs work. We've got the LHS and RHS bus, which we can select any of our four general purpose registers onto, and they get wired directly into the arithmetic and logic unit. Then the ALU can assert its current result back out onto the bus where we can put it wherever we want. So let's zoom in on the ALU. Now before we can go much further, we need to start thinking about what operations we're going to have in the ALU. We want some arithmetic operations. So we've got addition, subtraction, increment and decrement, which are kind of subcases of addition and subtraction. It's where the, the value you're adding or subtracting is always one. This is like the extremely common case. So most processors have a dedicated instruction there, so you're not worrying about an immediate constant. Multiply and divide, they're going to be handy. And compare. We want some logic operations, shifting left and shifting right. And we want some bitwise logic operations. So the, the normal set you see are AND or exclusive OR. And some processes not all have a NOT. You can create a NOT by exclusive ORing with a value with all its bits set. So some processes skip that one. Looking at these operations, now they're all handy. But by far and above the most complicated ones on this list are multiply and divide. Not all processors have those, and in this case, I've had a look at ways of implementing it, and including those operations is either going to change the way we work, or it's going to add an awful lot of circuitry that goes far beyond what the rest of the ALU is going to be. But it is worth mentioning them. Multiply and divide are useful operations, and we're going to want to be able to do that. But as long as we've got the basic building blocks, then we're going to be able to write subroutines that can multiply and divide. And it is worth us remembering the importance of that. So when we're looking at the exact instructions we're going to implement elsewhere in the ALU, we want to make sure we've got the facilities that make multiply and divide a reasonably performant operation. The next thing I want to do is talk about operand count. Some instructions will have a very simple form where you've got an operator and a simple operand. So increment and decrement would be like this. And virtually everywhere I've ever seen this, the result is immediately stored into the operand. So if we increment A, A simply becomes one higher. So that's fairly straightforward. But then there's kind of two different ways of operating for two parameters. The first is this one, where you have your left-hand side and right-hand side value, and then you have a separate destination. This is what most RISC processors do. And then you've got the simpler form where you have left-hand side and right-hand side performs the same operation, but the result is automatically stored into the left-hand side operand. This is a, a fairly common way of working, so the, the main 32-bit operations in x86 work like this. Now, which way we're going to do this is uh, an interesting decision, and it's one I've been thinking about quite a lot. Now, this is definitely the most easy to program for, but it does mean that the permutations of instruction increase quite dramatically. Let's have a look at that. If we've got four registers and a single operand, we just have one encoding of any given operation for each of those registers. We could obviously skip some if we wanted to, but normally you'll do them all. So if we were to increase to eight registers, we would have eight versions of each of the single operand opcodes. With two, however, it gets more complicated. Essentially, the number of instruction encodings is going to increase with the square of the number of registers. So with four registers, we've got 16 encodings. Now we can simplify that a little bit because for many of them, we have duplicate operations where, so for example, AND and OR, a value of itself, isn't really something that we've, we're specifically going to uh, want to do. You do write instructions for doing that sometimes on, on processors. One of the useful side effects of that is you'll see flag setting. So handing a register with itself is a quick way to detect if the result is zero. But we certainly don't need multiple different uh, opcodes that can perform that same side effect. So for some instructions, at least, we can remove those encodings. So that will drop us from 16 permutations to 12. But then if we were to look at free operands, we're raising the register count to the power of free. And that really gets insane. So here we've got 64 permutations. And in actual fact, if we were going to be having free operand instructions, there's actually additional registers we could place it in. A, B, C, and D, our four general purpose registers, are the only thing we can use as inputs to the ALU. 
but the output just goes onto the bus. So we could store it anywhere, directly into memory, or we could store it into the low or high halves of the transfer register. And that actually could have some use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off implementing in this simple form. The big reason for that and the constraint to four general purpose registers is just the sheer number of permutations. So we're still going to have either 12 or 16 permutations of each ALU operation, or at least all the two ones with two parameters. And so we're going to add up a lot of ins different instruction combinations quite quickly. And at the moment, the design only supports an 8-bit opcode. So we've only got 2 to the power of 8, 256 different encodings for instruction. And we're going to run out of room very quickly on that. And if we were to increase the instruction width to 16 bits or even make it 8 bits and 16 as an option, then we would be doing two memory operations to, to fetch each instruction and we would halve our effective throughput. So particularly with cases where we could do the same operation with two simpler instructions, we, we might see a benefit from doing that. So how are we going to do it? Now there are arithmetic and logic chips which can do pretty much all of this. In fact, some of them are, are a lot more functional, but we're trying to build this process of them first principles. So we should go a bit simpler but there are a, a number of different options for fairly straightforward adder chips. So let's assume we're going to uh, drop that in first. So initially we can take our two inputs, pass it straight to an adder, and then we can assert the output back out onto the bus. And that will give us add functionality. Now moving on to subtract. Now that's slightly more interesting. I will, in the description, add a link to Benita's excellent video on two's complement arithmetic, which is worth a watch if you're not familiar. But the principle is you can negate the value of a number in two's complement format by inverting all the bits and adding one to it. And this is a particularly useful format for numbers in processors, because if you add two numbers and you turn one of them into its two's complement form, then that's the equivalent of a subtract. And so we definitely uh, would like to take advantage of this. Now, we've, we've already discussed that we want to be able to perform logical operations, so we should add the hardware for doing that, and we should introduce it in such a way that it can um, control one of the inputs to the add. So we're going to take the right-hand input, and we're going to feed that into our bitwise logic. Now we're going to need some flags and add operations have both a carry out and a carry in. So we're going to wire that into our flags control. One thing that's important there is to perform a, a true twos complement operation, we need to invert the incoming bits, but we also need to add one. So we can use the, uh, the incoming carry bit to do that. So we're going to wire some control for the flags to the pipeline. What I'm intending to do here is give the capability to clear the flag, to use the previous operations carry flag in the next operation or to force override it to be a, a zero or a one. Between those two sections we're going to be able to implement our two's complement conversion and implement subtraction. So as long as our bitwise logic also has a mode where it will pass through the value unchanged will uh, will not affect our, our add functionality. Now while we're talking about flags it would be worth talking about additional flags so we would add a comparison to zero on the output and feed that back into the flags register. And all of these flags are going to need an output back to the, the control units in the pipeline. Everything we've done here makes total sense, but we're still missing our shift operations. Now we don't have a specific reason to, to put that anywhere here. We could put it after the add, we could put it between the bitwise logic and the add, or we could put it before the bitwise logic. But in any of these locations, it will extend the total time it takes for us to get a result. So the good place to put it here would be on the other input to the add. Now I don't see any particular uses for, do it, for doing that, apart from the shifts can be hidden as, alongside the bitwise logic. So at most they're gonna be roughly equivalent and we're not gonna be adding any additional time constraint. Now we could, with a shift, shift, use it in conjunction with the add to implement um, a few interesting operations, like we could do a multiply by three with a, a shift left and an add of the same value. But I don't have any plans to implement that at the moment. Our bitwise logic will need to be able to have both inputs coming into it. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about is the overall amount of time it's going to take to complete these operations. 
Now, if we were to stick the values into the inputs, we can expect that to happen quite quickly. But then we've got like half a cycle later, we're going to be trying to pull a, an answer back out. That's not going to work very well. So let's assume that this is all going to take a couple of cycles to complete. Now that means that we wouldn't be able to do back-to-back -back operations. We'd have to issue an ALU operation, then have a one cycle gap, and then we read the result back out. Now obviously the pipeline gives us facilities for doing this kind of thing. We've already flagged that we will dispatch ALU operations in pipeline stage one, and then we'll complete them in pipeline stage two once they've had a, a chance to perform their operations. But this would be pretty bad because it would be really good to uh, perform back-to-back operations. So the way we solve this is we introduce latches. Now these are effectively registers that sit inside the ALU. So in the first cycle we perform the shift operation and any bitwise logic or whichever one of those is appropriate. In both cases we'll have the capability for an immediate pass through of the value and then at the end of that cycle they get stored in these latches and then in the next cycle they're fed on into the adder. And this way in any given cycle we can have one operation down here in the lower half while a second operation is taking place in this upper half immediately before the, the result is stored. So this is uh, actually going to be pretty good. That does mean that we'll be able to have back-to-back -back ALU operations. We will introduce some new limitations in that if we perform an operation and then another operation in the next instruction slot that uses the result, then that value is not actually going to be available yet. Now on the flags, with shifting, we would have a carry flag there as well for the bit that is being pushed off either the top or the bottom. And so I'm going to add a separate logical carry from the arithmetic carry. Now that will mean that if we were to perform two sequential shifts, we could make them work together like a 16-bit operation or do four of them in a row to operate like a 32-bit operation. And we wouldn't have the extra weight while we were waiting for the carry flag to resolve itself in the next step. Okay, well I think we've just about covered everything there. This is a good block outline for our ALU. And in the next video, I will hopefully start to build the framework of this and get some uh, chips down in the breadboard. Thanks for watching.